Hi, I'm Jeff Edgers, national arts reporter for the Washington Post. So I wrote this story because when I was 14 years old in 1984, I was walking through the school cafeteria in a daze, staring at this Associated Press clip telling me that my favorite band, The Police, was breaking up. And they were breaking up after their most successful album, Synchronicity. So when I got the chance to find out why that happened and what drove the creation of that record, well, do I need to explain myself? Here's the story. In December 1982, the police flew to the Caribbean to record their fifth album. The executives at A&M Records were excited. A year earlier, the trio had leavened their raw, guitar-driven sound with moody keyboards and scronky saxophone fills for their fourth album, Ghost in the Machine, generating hit singles like Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic and Spirits in the Material World. Suddenly, they were filling arenas. But the atmosphere at Air Studios on the island of Montserrat quickly turned sour. Guitarist Andy Summers sniffed at lead singer Sting's demo of Every Breath You Take, this cheesy pop, not worthy of a band he still insisted was a guitar trio. Drummer Stuart Copeland bristled when the singer tried to give him orders. And Sting, who had been contemplating going solo, was tired of pretending this was still a democracy. Why were they arguing about whose songs were best? Wasn't it obvious? Even their usually unflappable producer, Hugh Padgham, phoned up his manager looking for a way to escape the island. These were the circumstances under which the police recorded one of the most popular records of the 20th century. This oral history of synchronicity comes as UME Polydor releases an illuminating box set on July 26, featuring a remaster of the 1983 original, as well as never-released outtakes, demos, and live recordings. You'll hear clips from this release. In-person interviews were done with Sting in New York and Copeland and Summers, both in Los Angeles. Responses have been edited for space and clarity. Copeland, a drummer for prog rockers Curved Air, and Sting, singer and bassist from jazz rockers Last Exit, connect in 1976 and decide to try to make it in London's exploding punk scene. Initially, they tap Henry Padovani, a snarling black leather guitarist from Corsica, as the third in their trio. Stuart Copeland. He was the only bona fide punk. Everybody loved Henry. Uh, they were suspicious of Sting and, and you know, put up their, their shields when I started talking at them. Henry Padovani. He wanted to put a punk band together, and you just don't do that. It doesn't work. You're either a punk band or you're not, but trying to sort of dress as punks, act as punks, write songs like if they were punk songs, that sort of cred didn't work. So the police was really struggling. Sting. I like bossa nova. I like, you know, ninth chords and sixths and flattened <laughs> fifths. Most of my music is built on ninths. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hmm. Most of my songs are built on arpeggiated ninths. Stewart. I learned later that Sting had all had always had these songs. Um, I don't know why he never mentioned them. How come we were playing my shit songs? How come we didn't say, dude, I got a better song here? Sting. Because Henry couldn't play the songs I'd written. For some reason it was me who had was given the job to fire Henry. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it was very difficult. Yeah. But he, he was very, he was a gentleman. He was very understanding. They meet Summers at a recording session. Stuart. Andy was super cool. Um, not a gregarious person. When we heard Andy playing with that clarity, with that vocab, just his huge vocabulary, with his dynamic charisma on guitar the music coming out of that instrument lit us up nile rogers super producer and chic guitarist 
So Andy, he had an amazing tone. He's a great player, but I mean, the sound of that that band is that that guitar and that incredible, um, you know, phasing, um, uh, flanging sound. I mean, come on, giant steps are what you down down wang wang. If you take away that guitar sound, you don't have the police. Kathy Valentine, the Go-Go's bassist. I saw them at Madame Wong's uh, on their very first tour and when they were all wearing the jumpsuits and stuff and there was nobody like them. The, the police were really different because they were virtuosos. They had this kind of worldliness and mystication that I didn't see in any other band. And I don't think of them as fake punks. I, I thought looked at punk rock as being very open. Bill Flanagan, author and MTV executive. I went to a record store appearance. They did. They did it in Boston. The manager said, well, you can take, you can each take 10 cassettes or something. And they flipped out and they, they, they all went for the jazz infusion. And I remember thinking, wow, that's interesting. But then, of course, it made sense. So many of the punk and new wave bands were a little older than you thought they would be, you know? I mean, The Clash and The Cars and and, um, Ramones and The Talking Heads. After the third Police album, Zenyatta Mandata, becomes the first to crack the U.S. top ten, the bandmates swap out their original producer, Nigel Gray a physician who had started a recording studio as a hobby, for Padgham, who'd created hits for XTC and Phil Collins with his reverb laden in the air tonight. Stuart. We never got into a fist fight. And the reason why we're screaming at each other is because we both give a sh**. Andy. Great art, great music doesn't come out of a mellow band. You don't want mellow. Avoid it. It's all that tension and creative differences that make it... I always thought, yeah, what is the music? I said, it's it's the sound of a very tight compromise. That's what it is. Sting. I think if we'd had more in common, we would have been together. The same way the E Street Band are together. Mm. We don't all come from the same street or the same neighborhood or the same town. It's completely different backgrounds. Andy's from Bournemouth in the south of England, you know, sort of genteel part of the world. I'm from Newcastle. Stuart was brought up in Beirut, the CIA, and you know, but his dad was, you know, one of the founder members of the OSS. So it's a it's a false family, really. Miles Copeland, Stewart's brother and manager of the police. Stewart knew that the Sting's songs made the police, that it was really more about Sting than any of the other three. Um, so there was the intellectual Stewart who understood 100% the reality. Then there was the emotional Stewart, the Stewart that the police was his. Nobody had anything to do with it. It was all it was all him. It was totally irrational. Andy. I like the second album, Regatta de Blanc, because I thought that's where we were still raw. There was so much energy in the tracks, and I felt that's where we really became the police. By the third album, you know, there's all sorts of politics and pressure. By the fourth album, this is getting difficult, you know. And for the fifth album, it's almost impossible for us to come together and do that. Sting. I think it was in 1980. Actually, it was 1981. I played the Secret Policeman's Ball in London for Amnesty. Amnesty International. And I sang Message in a Bottle on my own and Roxanne on my own with guitar. And I thought, I can do this on my own. And I enjoyed doing it on my own. And so that gave me the idea. It, it didn't act on it for another three years. Stuart. 
sometime during Zenyatta was when I got feeling that he was feeling that way. By the way, in my secret diaries, I was saying that in my secret diaries in 1978. Kathy Schenker, a and Vice President, Sting's future manager. I think a little bit of him felt an obligation to Stuart uh, for really plucking him out of obscurity. And I think uh, the money was appealing. And the other thing was an uncertainty. I mean, he's always liked risk. He's always been drawn to challenging himself. But and that was really an unknown, and there were very few other major members of a group that were going off on their own and making it. After some unaccustomed time off between albums, Sting starred in a movie, Summers recorded with a side project combo, the police reunited in Montserrat for synchronicity. Sting brought a set of new songs inspired by Hungarian journalist Arthur Kessler's writings on paranormal phenomena. Hugh Padgham. We started trying to record. After, after about a week, if not 10 days, we did not have one backing track. If somebody had come down to the studio and said, play us a song, there wasn't anything to play. Sting. You know, band starts off and no one's roles are clearly defined uh, in, in this case it was Stuart's band and he was the drummer and Andy was the you know the great guitarist but the currency of the band were songs I was writing those songs so that that creates a lot of tension because every Every song that comes into the on the table has to go through the process. So, and they would write as much as I, I was writing, but they weren't so they weren't good enough, frankly. Hugh Padgham. The deal was that Andy and Stuart had to have a song of theirs on on the album. Sting. So we get Mother. Stewart. He and Hugh Padgham have this I have said um, it was hard telling Andy and Stuart that their songs were crap. Um, and Sting said it's like telling somebody their girlfriend's ugly. Well, just for the record, those ugly girlfriends of mine uh, rejected by the band on Montserrat er, got me a Golden Globe nomination and a Grammy nomination as the score for Rumblefish. I regret that I didn't support Andy more, but then again, Sting's right about one thing. He's wrong that the other songs were crap, except for Mother, he's right about that. Andy. Well, you know, f- Sting, that's all I can tell you. I was listening to Captain Beefheart, and that's what I wanted to do, something like that. During that period, I wrote songs that were better than his, but, you know, he would, you know, take the upper whip hand because he was a singer and go, well, I'm not doing anything. You know, it got down to, like, three-year-olds, Oh, I'm not going to sing that today. Oh, f*** you. Hugh Padgham. Sometimes I, I was just so depressed working with them. I remember going out of the studio and ringing up my manager and saying, I'm not sure if I can, if I can handle this. Stuart. Synchronicity was the one where it really got to the point where we really felt we're not going to, we're not going to succeed here. And I could be wrong. I mean, my own bruised feelings told me my analysis was that they hate me and they want me out. Andy. It reached a point where we we need somebody else to come and we need a producer, we need a producer. And, you know, George Martin, the owner of the air record, was on the island at the time. Well, let's get George Martin, you know. He's... We're big enough, you know, he'll come and manage, produce us. So, you know, the, the thing is here, the, the uh, studio is on a hill, that, and then there's this valley, and then George was over on the other side. So I get the job, you know, walking through the fucking jungle, 
fighting off everything in the way until I got to George Martin's yeah. house, you know. The maid opens the door and I'm asked for Mrs. Oh, he's in there, yeah, come and see it, you know. And he goes, hello, hello. You know, he's very much like an admiral. Uh, right. Very nice, like yeah. a real gentleman, very nice. So we said, I have a cup of tea, you know. And I'm telling him, oh, I'm having a really hard time of it, you know. It's just, can't get along. He's, Would you come and produce? Oh, you know, I think it's going to be all right. I think, you know, sort of reassuring me, you know, just go, yeah, kind of, it's going to be all right, you know. You know this is coming on from, from on high, the producer of the Beatles. He said, I think when you go back, it's all going to work out. So I said, all right, well, didn't get him. So I trudge all the way back into the studio, get back there, and they're still there. And for some, it, it, there'd been this sort of a shift, a sort of psychological shift, would you put it, or cosmic shift. Suddenly we were very polite to one another and we were very nice. And we go, oh, would you like to put the drum there, Stuart? Oh, okay, I'll do it. So, you know, we're all very nice to one another and sort of overly polite. And that's the way the rest of the record went on. Hugh Padgham. This is my recollection, is that Miles was summoned to come to the island for a meeting. And we actually had a meeting around the swimming pool and and I think it sort of ended up with a vote on do we carry on making this album or do we stop? Stuart. Well, we all listened to Miles and if Miles came down and, you know, I, I just sort of, it, I guess it brought us down to earth and brought us each out of our silo um, and to, you know, not be grumbling to ourselves about the injustices of the world and of the band, but having to actually, so what's the next song? Sting recorded multi-track demos of his ideas in which he provided all the instrumentals and vocals and presented them to the group. They included a keyboard ballad called Every Breath You Take, the driving title track and Oh My God, a song he first recorded almost a decade earlier with his previous band, Last Exit. Sting. I had a little Casio keeper that only played single note. <laughs> That's what I played on Spirits in the Material World. That melody is me on a Casio with a cost Really? Do, 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 do. Yeah. And then I got a, um, a Prophet six or something that's a synthesizer it's all these string sounds I I got a synclavia after that but that was the state of the art in a sequence song and um, loved that and I in that song Walking in Your Footsteps was me sequencing just having fun sequencing so the, the songs weren't created in the band they were created outside Jeff Ayeroff, Senior Vice President, Creative Services, a and Records. I actually was in the in the studio when Every Breath You Take is recorded. Hmm. When Sting does the, his vocal for it. I'd, I'd heard it on a demo. And it was like, okay, that's going to be the first single. Hugh Padgham. Stuart was very anti Every Breath You Take because... Stuart wanted to play his style of drumming on it, and Sting didn't. You know, Sting wanted it a bit more like the demo, which was, like, very, very simple. Stuart. That's not what actually happened. Eventually, I totally bought into the notion of it's not a drum set track. It's a hypnotic rhythm track. But... In fact, there are timpani, there are drum overdubs, there's gong drum, there's cymbal swells, there's all kinds of cool shit. Andy. What I remember is a demo, up and down the fucking keyboard, you know, f***ing, the absolute antithesis of what the police were. Hmm. We were a guitar trio. That was it. And I didn't think it was great. You know, and Sting and Stuart could not agree on it at all. You know, where's the kick drum and the bass going to be? You know, there was just no consensus at all. And Sting finally said, we had lunch one day. Go on, go make it your own. 
we came back in the afternoon to record again. It was, yeah, it was very simple. It's, so it was very easy for me to play dun dun ding dun ding dun ding. You know, it was very natural. Mm. But I played that, and of course everybody stood up in the control room and cheered. That was it. Bill Flanagan, author and MTV executive. And, you know, every breath you take is like, hey Jude, it's just an undeniable song. It's bigger than anything they could ever do or anything they could ever do afterwards. Stewart. That is probably my favorite song on the record. He's talking about King of Pain. Love the lyric. I even listened to the lyric on that. And it's so poignant. And it's so honest and so sting. I love that song. That is one of my favorite songs that he ever wrote. I didn't do anything special with that at all. I just put a backbeat on it. Jeff Ayeroff, wanting to upgrade the band's promotional tools, hires musicians turned video producers Kevin Godley and Lowell Cream, and shows them a black and white film of jazz man Lester Young for inspiration. Jeff Ayeroff. In England, they were like a pop band. For us, Police was an important band, not a pop band. I wanted to basically get away from the, the, the kind of dismissible videos which I think colored their, you know, seriousness and they didn't have any gravitas hmm. and to try and do something that had some gravitas. And MTV was a pipeline to every kid in America. Kevin Godley. They wanted something that was very classic and went in the complete opposite direction of what you might imagine a typical music video was at that period of time. And they were very all glossy and, and, and bright colors and fast cutting and everything. We didn't want that. Jeff Ayeroff. A friend of mine, Leslie Libman, who became a video director now as an episodic television director, she showed me a film called Jam in the Blues by Jean Milly, who was a famous photographer and it was a video from the 30s or 40s. It's black and white. Sting. I what? love the black and white. I, th I thought it was very classy. I thought we all look great. Um, we made it at Charlie Chaplin's uh, soundstage on a and M on the A&M lot. Trudy visited. It was the first time she'd come to America. That's Trudy Styler, his future wife. She met Herb Albert and went weak at the knees. Huh. <laughs> still the most handsome man in the universe um, we stayed at the Chateau Montmont that was that was great it was great to be with Trudy at that time she protected me released on June 17 1983 Synchronicity knocks Michael Jackson's thriller off the top of the charts by the end of July and spends 17 weeks at number one the tour opens to more than 40,000 people at Chicago's Comiskey Park, and opening acts for the 105 shows around the world included R.E.M., Talking Heads, James Brown, Joan Jed and the Blackhearts, and Thompson Twins. It was one of the top-grossing tours of the 1980s. And the end of the police. Tessa Niles, backup singer. Just the sound of the crowd and the cheering was unlike nothing I'd heard. The sound on stage was so loud and so One, extraordinary. Two, three. You know, from three guys, three guys. I was, it was insane. Um, I became aware as time went on that there were tensions and, and frictions, but. On stage, it didn't seem to do anything other than fuel the gigs. They were just incredible every night. And there was never any sense that 
they were pissed off with each other and maybe they just worked it out on stage. Alana Curry, the Thompson twins, in an interview with me that wasn't recorded, said, quote, the standout one for me was at the LA Raceway, 50,000 people in the audience, so the biggest we'd ever played. The band had a big argument at Soundcheck, and I think there was even a bit of a punch-up between Stewart and Sting. A lot of tension and shouting and swearing. Being the support band, we just lay low and tried to keep out of their way. But then I was standing at the side of the stage when they went on to play that night. It was a perfect warm summer evening, and they were incredible. Really tight. Perfect timing. Sublime drumming. And Sting's vocals were incredible. The three women who were doing backup vocals had extraordinary voices that just soared. They were dressed head to toe in soft black fabric that blew in the breeze. It was magical, one of the best gigs I witnessed, and I wasn't even a police fan. Andy. It was it was almost like, you know, in a sense, like the, the height of the rock era. No one had ever done this kind of shit before. We played Shea Stadium with the second band since the Beatles to play it. I mean, it was sort of a glorious moment. Sting. In the, I think after Shea Stadium, you know, I said, I think, I think we we should stop now. And my memory of that meeting was that everybody agreed, or that maybe they'd just been so sick of me. Kathy Schenker, A and M vice president, Sting's future manager. And from the moment Sting said. I want to start my own band and I'm going to leave. I knew it was over. And there was no talking him into it, which, believe me, lots of people tried. Sonia Christina, Curved Air singer and Copeland's first wife. It felt like this was the end. There was no sort of feeling that they were going to get together again sort of next year or whatever. You know, they were sort of stopping at the, at the top of their game in a way. I think it was just, you know, the creative spark between Stuart and and Sting. Um, you know, it couldn't spark anymore with the way that it was. Sting. We're very, very connected emotionally, but we can't work together. And it's as much my fault as it's his. But we do love each other. Hmm. And I have utmost respect for him as a musician, as a as a a mind, an energy. I love it, but I can't work with it. Stuart. Music has a different function in our lives. Hmm. We make it for different reasons. We listen to it for different reasons. And the biggest difference, which causes the most problem, is that a songwriter quite reasonably feels that the reason for a band is to support the song. Now, I'm a drummer. I bang I don't listen to the lyrics. The song is in service of the group. And, by the way, this cognition of the problem has arrived 40 years later. Uh, he just thought I was being an asshole. I just thought he was being a um, And we didn't understand the fundamental purpose of our lives as musicians were diametrically opposed. Sting. I haven't completely processed it. I mean, I'm grateful for it. Yeah. I really am. I have, I have all of this because of that band. And my, my career was launched on, on the success of the place. Andy. The thing about the band is it, it broke up too quickly. You know, I mean, you know, we were the best band, still one of the best band as far as I'm concerned of the 80s. I don't think there's anybody can compete with us. And we're way bigger than anybody like the Talking Heads. But because it got broken up early, for whatever reasons, you know, way ahead of its time, uh, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't assumed the proportions. Maybe it should have it in terms of legend or whatever. Sting. The pain that we caused each other didn't match the joy of making music. You know, it almost wasn't worth it. But of course it was. But I, I haven't figured out what the equation is. But I, I don't think there was any other way. The 
This story was written and narrated by me, Jeff Edgers. The audio was produced by Bishop Sand. Audio clips courtesy of UME Polydor.